Composition guidelines are very useful in landscape photography, but sometimes you've got to break the rules. Now in this video I want to cover something which is quite dear to my heart and that is the, the use or sometimes a, a misuse, uh, ignoring of landscape photography compositional rules. Now I'm sure we're all familiar with some of these rules and I'm going to cover five of them in this video uh, quite briefly hopefully. But first off just worth probably quoting from a couple of my favourite photographers. Firstly Ansel Adams. Now Ansel Adams said there are no rules for good photographs, just good photographs wholeheartedly agree. If you see a good photograph, you don't try and automatically work out what rules were applied to it. Similarly, Edward Weston, another of the, the early masters of the, the 20th century in terms of photography and, and pushing the boundaries, he said that composition was the strongest way of seeing. Simply put, arranging the elements in a way where it gives the most impact. It's trying to convey that message across to you. So anyway, without further ado, let's launch into the first of those popular rules we all seem to adhere to, and that is the rule of thirds. Now, the rule of thirds has been around for, for many centuries, many millennia. Uh, the ancient Greeks, I think, called it the golden rule, and it is one of the most popular rules. It, it's something you'll often hear photographers and uh, other vloggers talk about how they're arranging the elements on on the third or you know they're splitting the sky and the foreground into those important thirds and arranging all the elements around it. Now looking at uh, uh, some examples of, of photographs which conform to the rule of thirds is, is useful I think at this stage. Now this is one I took last year and it is of an old quarry up in North Wales. Now the elements here are arranged very much in the pattern of thirds. We have the important uh, probably the most important object here, which is the old ruin, but it's balanced on the opposite third by a telegraph pole. And also you'll notice that the, the foreground occupies roughly a third of the image and the sky two thirds. So very important that those components sit harmoniously. They, they, they feel balanced and they feel at, at rest with each other. Similarly, if you look at an image taken with a, a square format camera, here we have the sky occupying roughly a third of the image, foreground two thirds. Very importantly though, the main compositional element here is the rising sun. Now that is placed up on the top right third. Your eye is drawn in there, it's balanced with the rest of the frame. Although a lot of the frame in the foreground is quite simplistic, it's absolutely imperative that it's there to support that journey your eye goes on, drawing you through the frame to the most important elements. But not all images will conform to that natural model, that, that sort of compositional crutch, if you like. This one here is just a, a riot. It's an absolute jumble of information. It's, it's, like, it's like, almost like an assault which is going on here. It's so, there's so much going on, there's, there's no single strong object. And it's all about the, the new growth. Your eye is, is going all over the frame. There's a couple of trees in the middle, but they're not particularly located on a strong compositional element guideline. It's all about the mass of detail. And similarly with this image here, the horizon is not only split down the center, and we'll get to that in a minute, but the, the small islands that are in this reservoir, which are being exposed by a low level of water, aren't placed on any particularly strong line uh, frame. They are where they felt best, they balance each other out, the one on the left and the one on the right, the slight overlap they offer, combined with the receding hills and the trees, it's all to my eye the best way of seeing that particular image. Similarly, in this image here, the rocks are pretty much of a muchness, they, they, they litter the, the, the front of the frame, they're not particularly placed uh, at the bottom and they're not particularly prominent in terms of the rest of the frame, but they're there to support the overall image which is one of dull rainy day but there is no particularly strong element on a third there and again the image is split probably 50 50 between foreground and background so not again following the rules but to my eye it works now this one is is one of my particular favorites now this does not conform to to any particular rule whatsoever this image is is all about about nature and the sense of scale you look at it you've got the, the tiny castle compared to nature you've got the towering hills uh, to the right and you've got the sky which is vastly more important than, than the actual castle. The castle is just like a little anchor in the bottom left and it's not placed on a third. The, the horizon line, the, the sort of shoreline is not placed on a third. There is no object there which occupies a traditional position of thirds. 
Now foreground interest is very important to landscape photographers. It's something you'll often hear people talk about. They need to anchor the frame with something in the foreground. And that is very much the case in a lot of photographs, a lot of my photographs, but not always the case. You don't have to be a slave to that. Now, this often ties in with the use or overuse of wide angle lenses and super wide angle lenses in particular. They're very difficult to use. They're very, very difficult to use effectively for landscape photography. I'd say you need a good skill level to make consistently good use of a, a very wide angle lens. So if you look at some of the examples of where a wide angle lens has used the foreground composition to the best advantage, particularly in this one here of Derwentwater where we have some rocks in the foreground and we have ice forming on them and the mountains in the background are, are sort of like the, you know, your destination for your eye. But without that foreground, if you actually blank out the foreground with your hand, it would be a very boring shot indeed, just a shot of some mountains on their own. So it needs that foreground element. Similarly, if you look at this one here, now this was taken last year on a very, very dull, bleak day really. And it's important when you look at it that the, the rocks stand out. So I've highlighted the rocks, I've dodged them out. And those rocks are there to anchor the image, to give it a base. And then you've got the sky powerfully at the top, illuminating various elements within the frame. But without the foreground, again, if you blank that foreground out, it really is a little bit lacklustre. There's nothing really there. But what if we don't want to use a, a dominant foreground object? Now, this one was taken a couple of years ago with a short telephoto lens. And I will say from the off here that when you move away from the wide angle lenses to a standard focal length, or even better, a short telephoto, you stop focusing or being, being obsessed perhaps with foreground interest. You start to concentrate on the bigger picture. And you also get a two dimensional view of the world. Now, this one was taken with the sole intention of giving you that feeling of, of spring, of growth. Now, there are no particularly strong elements. Yes, there are a couple of trees in there which are, are leaning into the frame and they are bringing their branches in with them, but there is no foreground interest. To me, it's a two-dimensional image and all the better for it. In a similar manner, this one was taken in North Wales a year or so ago. Again, from the position I was set up in, I could have put some rocks in the foreground. There were some boulders in the foreground, but I was after that lovely feeling of that, that sort of recession of the hills and the layering with the, the sort of atmospheric conditions. You put a foreground object in there, those hills are gonna be tiny. They're gonna be really small. You're gonna get a ton of sky in there. It's gonna all be about the foreground. This is all about the hills. This is the interleaving of the hills. It's all about the grayscale of the image. Another example would be where, in this case, I've used the longest end of my zoom lens. This is equivalent to 300 millimeters. Now these are just uh, sand patterns on the estuary in Barmouth and they were a fair old distance away and I wanted to exclude uh, all the foreground and all the background. So again, there is no foreground in there to, to sort of anchor the image, but the patterns themselves are what matters and they, they form the image. They, they are almost an abstract here. If I'd have put a tree or, or a branch or something else which took you into the image, you wouldn't be focusing on those and you wouldn't be thinking, what are they? You'd immediately say, oh, it's a beach image. I can see a mountain in the background and I've got a very nice foreground element. Very pleasant, but yeah, a bit meh. And finally, again, this is an example from a trip last year I took with my friend Robin. And this area in Torridon is a fantastic area for photographers, but there are also some very, very strong uh, compositional options using a foreground. Now, if you look at the option I had here in, in a wider shot I took with a 28 millimeter lens, I've got a lovely snaking road. Now that snaking road is the foreground. I've got something there which balances, you'd think, with the mountains in the background. But to me, it's a lot weaker because the mountains are sort of there. They're a supporting element and it's about the road and the foreground. But to me, what am I trying to say on this image? It's not as strong as the image where I've just got the mountains. And the mountains make you think, well, you know, where is this? Uh, you know, is it some remote landscape on an island somewhere? Is it uninhabited? You know, what's going on? It, it, it's all about the drama of the sky and the mountains. They're, they're sort of very moody and they don't need me to explain what they are by putting a road in and giving them more setting. They stand on their own. Now, leading lines or leading lines uh, seems to be a bit of a, a controversy about which one it is, but they're all the same thing. These are those, those lines which take you into the frame and everyone loves them in landscape photography. We're always looking for them as a stream, there's a wall, there's a branch, you know. It, everyone's looking for that leading line because people think it's absolutely essential. It is important. And if you look at some images where 
a lead in line has made the image, this one for example in the Lake District taken by the Holger, without that path, you're not really going on a journey on this image, you're just rendering a bit of a, a fuzzy set of ferns and a blurry sky, that's what Holgers do, but with the path, much, much stronger, much more much more inquisitive, I think. Where's it going? You know, have you walked along that path? Who's been along that path? Similarly, this one taken um, a year or so ago in Wales, and I have uh, dodged and burned this one quite considerably to accentuate that lovely line that snakes through the scene. Again, if you play down that line, that leading line, or you remove it altogether, take a different crop, it's a nothing image. The sky, whilst nice, is just a dramatic sky. Anyone can do that in Photoshop or Lightroom. What makes it is that pathway. It, again, it, it's gone right through the frame and it has come through from the bottom right and it takes you out or it goes out in the bottom right, depending how you look at it. It's a very, very important element. It is the element of the frame. And finally, another very strong example of where this lead in line will work to your advantage is in this shot of an old slate quarry in North Wales. Now, the old slate uh, wall, fence if you like, snakes in from the bottom left. So already your eye has gone down there and without knowing it, you've been drawn up through the frame because that's where the wall, that line is taking you. And right at the top of the frame, you have the main element of the scene, which is the old ruin, the old derelict building. But it'd be nothing without that lead in line. But we don't always have to have that, that lead in line. Now, in this example here, taken in Derwent Water in the Lake District, I decided to emphasize the mountains. The trees sort of provide a sort of supporting frame, but the mountains are everything. I mean, they look absolutely magnificent with their dusting of snow. However, I did have the option of using uh, another frame from this uh, sequence. Now, this one had the river uh, snaking down underneath Ashness Bridge. It's a classic view. You've got that leading line and, you know, you're going underneath the bridge and you think to yourself, well, it takes me out to the mountains. That's lovely. But now it's all about the bridge and the river. The mountains are small. I'm, I'm not particularly impressed with the mountains. They're not sort of like awe-inspiring. They're now a very small element at the back of the frame and the sky actually dominates them. Whereas in the original shot, it's all about the mountains. Everything else supports those. It's a much stronger shot, even though there's no lead in line. And finally, an example here. I went out and I shot in my local forest and I was looking to use these trees here to lead my eye through the frame. And I spent ages composing with them and, uh, you know, what a terrible shot this one is, even though it's got that branch coming in and another one coming in. And you think your eye goes somewhere, but it's not going anywhere. So what I did was to choose a completely different uh, angle. I just turned around to the right, put a long lens on, and I made a point of focusing in on the saplings, the new growth, because this was about March, I think. And it's all about that subtlety of colour and the background is blurred out. There is, there is no lead into this. It's two dimensional. It's been flattened by that short telephoto again. I absolutely love this image and I have a large blow of it too. Now the next commonly used uh, tool or uh, should we say rule is not to put your horizons in the center. You're always being told it's like you need to put it really down on a third. So it's, one of, it's more, more of a subset of the rule of thirds. Don't put your horizon in the center. The image will be weak. Well, possibly. Now, if you look at a traditional uh, sort of landscape shot, which conforms to this rule, the, the basis of the image is, is the sort of the estuary and the mountains here in Barmouth. And I've ba balanced it all along the bottom in a third. This would not work at all if I put the mountains and the estuary in the center and the sky was just forming half the image. It really wouldn't work at all. So yeah, that does conform in many ways to the rule. However, if you look at this image here, now this image here was taken in, in North Wales a few years ago, about five years ago, and I have split the subject right down the center. And I've split it because it's all about reflection. The reflection is everything here. Without the reflection, without that balance, without that symmetry, it would be nothing. The sky was weak. I had to work on it quite a bit here in, in Lightroom to bring out some detail in the sky. It needs to be centered. It's all about that mirror image. Now, another one here, and this one was taken with a Holger uh, a year or so ago, and I've put the horizon smack bang in the middle. Now the sky itself, absolutely nothing in it, hardly anything in the foreground, very simple sea defences. This one works because I have a vignette. Now the vignette is created naturally by the Holger's terrible single element plastic lens, but without the vignette, it would run away from you. Your eye would drift out the top of the frame. I'm pulling you back into the frame and I'm bringing you down to those sea defences. Now, when I tried composing this with the horizon at the top or the bottom, it just felt weak. It needed to be centered. 
It's just the right balance for this particular image. I just think the center split, again, not mirrored, but it's got that balance between sky and foreground. And finally, an example here taken with a Holger pinhole camera about, about 10 years ago. Now this one is split dead down the middle again, but this one isn't a mirror image. There's, there's some reflections going on there, but the reflections are of little interest to me. I'm not really bothered if the water's rippled. The sky is quite dramatic because it was a pinhole shot and there's movement in it. But if I'd have included too much sky, I'd have ended up with not enough reeds. Now the reeds to me are just as important. You're right up against them with the pinhole camera and they are, they are the foreground. Without those reeds there, it is unbalanced towards the sky. If you took those reeds away now, it'd be too much river. The actual river Brathe in the middle would be too dominant and there's nothing in that river apart from a couple of weak reflections. So again, split right down the middle, absolutely nothing wrong. Now the final point I wanna cover here today is something which people will obviously uh, wrap your knuckles about if you use it and that's putting the subject bang in the center of your frame. It's something you just mustn't do. You, you've been told to offset it to one side or stick it up there in the top right or the bottom left. It, yeah, you know, don't put images in the center. Well, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Let's have a look at an image. So if we look at an example of a typical landscape image with all the usual components, there's a bit of a sky in there, there's a lake, there's a tree, there's a mountain. They all complement each other. The tree is offset. We've got the, the scree slopes to the right. Yeah, there's a mountain in the middle, but it's very much a supporting element. And we've got that lovely sky, which is pushing down on the top of the image. And they all complement each other. Try putting the, the major components of the tree in the center and it just kills it. But if we take another example, now this is an example, this is shot in a, a local forest near to me, where the center of the image is all that matters. Now I tried this offset and it immediately looked wrong. I didn't even bother pressing the shutter button. This lovely little tree is supported by a cast of tree trunks and a misty day. And those trunks are just there to frame that tree. It's all about that tree. You can't budge that off the center. It just won't work. Another example of the subject being right smack bang in the center is the mountain of Sleven in Assint, taken in Scotland last year. Now the mountain is smack bang in the center. Again, I moved the viewfinder around. I looked at it on the left, looked at it on the right. But in this instance, the, the interleaving of the uh, foreground, the, the mountain ranges and the hills, leads you through to the image. Now it leads you through to the hump of Sleven, which is a fantastic mountain. And if you try to recompose with the, the mountain left or right, that interleaving doesn't work. You end up with too much on one side or the other, and it just feels unbalanced. So in the center is the place for the mountain to go. Again, another simple example here, and that's worth mentioning at this point, that square format lends itself to central compositions far more than any other aspect ratio. I have to admit that if you shoot square format, you will find yourself putting things in the middle more often because it's completely balanced, whereas a three to two format, much more difficult. Here we have a tree, smack bang in the middle. It's also got the reflection and it is also split down the middle. So two of the rules broken there, but good luck trying it somewhere else. It just doesn't work. And the final example, and uh, probably one of my favorite examples in this case is taken, was this taken uh, earlier this year? No, late last year. And here, we have the, uh, the mountain of Skiddor in the Lake District. And I was waiting for that cloud for about 10 minutes to get into the center. Now the only snow on the tops was on the tops of Skiddor. So I put that in the middle and I waited for the cloud to come over it. It's focusing all your attention, especially with the, the clouds, as you can see as well, sorry, the, the shadow in the foreground. The sky is nothing at all, really. It's all about that cloud, that little bit of snow on the peak, right in the center of the frame. Again, you move these components, move the cloud or take it earlier or later, unbalanced. You move that mountain to the right, there was nothing down to the left. So just slavishly conforming to the rules to get that out the center ruins the image completely. So I hope you found that useful. Now, let's be clear. I'm not saying to you, ignore photographic rules. The photographic rules are there for a reason. They, they tend to work. You know, I actually had a great fun putting this video together because as I was going through most of my compositions, I found probably about 75% of them conform to one rule or another. Now that's not by choice. That's just the way it came out. I didn't go to that location and go, rule of thirds, it's a square image. Let's get that tree in the middle. I just moved the viewfinder around or I used my little, uh, oh, little iPhone app and it just looks right there. It's just a fact. What I am saying is when you go on a landscape shoot, don't just turn up and go onto autopilot. You know, you, you pile out the car, you go down to that lake and you're immediately looking for that boulder in the foreground or it's like, oh wow, there's a log 
gone into the into the the lake uh, and it's pointing in to that mountain or even even more so common there's that fence i've done it as well we all do it does that fence or does that jetty or does that break water and my eyes are going through it just think what am i trying to say about this scene what is the the most important element within the scene and how can i convey that now if that means putting on a you know 400 millimeter lens it means putting on a 400 millimeter lens if there's great foreground but it doesn't look very good with that foreground ignore that foreground Perhaps don't take your widest lens with you. Um, they're, they're very hard to use and you will almost inevitably start looking for foreground, even if it weakens the image. So anyway, yeah, probably longer than I thought, actually, uh, and I do apologise for that. But I hope you enjoyed it. hope you find it useful, uh, a bit thought-provoking, and I will see you again uh, pretty soon, hopefully.